Man, what about the choir? I love them. Uh, they, they've been doing that since 6 o'clock this morning, y'all. Isn't that something? I mean, they have been here all day long. They've been doing that. They were here doing that when I got here. So uh, that tells you something, man. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. John chapter 2. My name is Tim Harris. I'm pastor at Woodburn Baptist Church. Happy Easter, y'all. Isn't it beautiful? It's such a pretty day. It's springtime. I slept with the windows open last night. And y'all know me. I'm cold all. I'm like your grandma. I'm cold all the time. But oh, I, I love this. I love today. I love being here with you. I love Easter. And uh, I love so much the chance to preach with you today. John chapter 2 is where I will be. It is Easter. I don't know what, what Easter means to you, what, what makes Easter for you. Since Easter always falls on Sunday, most people have at least in their mind that church going is a part of celebrating Easter, and here we all are, so obviously that, that counts us. Easter always falls in the springtime, so for that reason, it's associated with everything that has to do with new life, so we have baby bunnies and flowers and eggs and uh, all those things that signify new life, uh, so there's that. Now, for some of us, it's a chance to buy a new dress or a new pair of shoes or otherwise get this family cleaned up for once and try to get out and look like, look like regular people. And uh, you've done a good job with that. It, it is sometimes about clothes for us, getting to church, all, all of that. For some of us, it's about a, a basket, Easter basket. Who, who got an Easter basket? Hands up. Um, yeah. Some of you are a little, little, I think, would age out for Easter basket, but that's okay. Uh, Man, Easter's not a big candy holiday, but there's candy at Easter, so let's talk about that and say, well, what's your favorite Easter candy? Just eat Easter. What'd you say? Who's The Cadbury eggs? You mean like the, okay, you got to be specific, Cadbury eggs, but there's the Cadbury egg that you bite into it and it, it's runny inside? Caramel sounds good. I don't like the ones that you bite into it and Preparation H comes out, the white stuff. <laughs> Y'all know what I mean? It's like white with something yellow. I think it's supposed to recreate what it is to suck a raw egg, but you know, that's bad. That, that's bad. Uh, what else? Now tell me either the Easter candy you love or the Easter candy you hate. Either way, we'll go either way. The, a Lent chocolate bunny. I take, you, I take it you like this. You love a, a Lent chocolate bunny. Dark chocolate bunny. They, there, there you go. Yeah, those aren't the ones they sell at the dollar store. You're talking about, yeah, a, a, a nice one. Anybody else? Yeah, like the Whoppers? Yeah, me too. Yeah, I love those. I, I love Whopper, like the Robin Eggs, more than anything. I mean, I would eat those year-round. Um, I especially like the ones that are duds, you know what I mean? Like when you put it in your mouth and it's, and it's, it's not a Whopper, it's something else, uh, but they're really kind of flat. I, I love those the best. Um, any black jelly bean lovers? Really? Yeah. I, Doug, really? Yeah. They may, you can like buy an entire bag of jack, black jelly beans now. I, I assume those are for people who don't like themselves. I mean, you know why. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I know some people like them. They taste just like oil to me. I mean, they're just terrible, yeah. Um, I love Smarties. I think there's one thing we can all agree on, though. Those Reese's, like eggs. Yeah, aren't those the best? Um, the white chocolate Reese's eggs are actually the best. Uh, that's in the Bible, I think. Um, uh, so there's baskets, there's bunnies, there's all, all of these things. Easter has to do with so many happy pastel colors and, and everything else, but let me remind you of something very important on this day of all days. Um, the first Easter wasn't anything like that. When the women got up early, they were not going to church. They were going to the grave. They were going to prepare for burial a body that had already been dead and in the ground for about two and a half days, so this was not going to be a pleasant job. You know this, right? You and I know that the women are going to get to the tomb and find that tomb open and empty, and, and Jesus is going to be alive. We know that. They did not know that. They were in a living nightmare, the worst weekend by far of their lives, and it hadn't 
been over yet and it wasn't over yet. They were going to a grave. I think you know that. They do find the tomb empty. The tomb is open and the tomb is empty. But even that, please, please make no mistake, the empty tomb is nobody's proof that Jesus is alive. An empty tomb doesn't prove anything. An empty tomb raises more questions th than it does answers. If you walk into an empty tomb, your only real response is to think, well, where'd the body go? Where's the body? What do they do with the body? The empty tomb doesn't in any way suggest to you the Easter message, and it doesn't work that way in the Bible either. If they only encounter the empty tomb, if you pay attention, the disciples, the women, they walk out of the empty tomb typically with, with two things, uh, some mixture of confusion and fear. They're afraid. So the empty tomb doesn't convince anybody of anything, and going to the empty tomb, or for that matter, going to church, doesn't necessarily make it Easter. The women don't understand what's happened until they see Jesus until they see Jesus alive, until they have a personal encounter with the living Christ, that's when they begin to understand that he's alive. And that's when Easter kicks in, but not until and never until you meet Jesus personally alive. You know? Now that doesn't mean that in Jesus' life, everybody who ever met him was overwhelmed with joy, because that's not how it works. There were those who despised Jesus, and especially those among the religious crowd. The religious folks hated Jesus. It's the strangest thing. But he was uh, offensive to their entire hollow, self-righteous way of life, and they hated him. They hated him. As a matter of fact, it was the religious people who threw out the gospel story. It's the religious people who tried to kill him. It's religious people who would follow him around and just listen. They would get the transcript of every sermon, everything he said. They just wanted him to say something that they could use to hang him with. They wanted him to say something or do something that they could end up using and bringing him down. They wanted to kill him. Understand, they plotted to kill him. And finally, one day, Jesus gave them what they needed. It was on that day, we talked about it last week, it was on that day when Jesus went into the temple and he cleansed the temple. Remember, the money changers, the animal merchants were there and Jesus turned over the tables, turned everything upside down like he owned a place and it's that day that they said, what makes you think you can do that? By whose authority? Give us a sign. And Jesus in that moment says the words that more or less get him killed. He's gonna say the words that will be exhibit A in his trial his trial, they will bring back these words and it will be these words that uh, you could say get Jesus killed. Uh, so let's read John chapter two. We're gonna start in verse 13. Part of this is, I know it's a review of what we talked about last week, but pay attention to the words that get Jesus killed. John chapter two, verse 13, y'all there? It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem in the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and the cattle, scattered the money changers' coins over the floor, turned over their tables. Then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scriptures. Zeal for God's house will consume me. But the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. What? Thanks, man. It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you can rebuild it in three days? When Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this, and they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. 
destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Those are the words that got him killed. There's a terrific church in Lexington, Kentucky called Emmanuel, Emmanuel Baptist Church. Some of you probably have heard of Emmanuel. Uh, several years ago, the week right before Easter, somebody slipped into the church, and to this day, nobody knows who did this. Nobody knows. But somebody slipped in the church and left a, a, a dark attache case, like a briefcase. They just left a, a, an attache case in front of the secretary's desk and left. Nobody saw them come in. Nobody saw them leave. Nobody has any idea how that briefcase ended up in front of the secretary's desk. But it had a note on it that said, you know, for the pastor, get it to the pastor. Um, they joked about it at first because it just all seemed really suspicious and weird. And, and, and so they joked that, you know, it could be anthrax. You know, somebody's trying to poison the pastor. It could be a bomb, you know, they said. And um, The pastor came and he picked it up and and that case was heavy as lead, heavy. And, and he was a little nervous himself as, as he took it, he put it on his desk and uh, he hesitated to open it. I mean, I mean you don't wanna overreact, you, you know? But at that point, he was really, really beginning to fear that this could be something terrible. Um, he slowly opened the case, he opened the lid and inside the briefcase, there was another box. It was a white cardboard box, again, heavy as lead, and it was wrapped with a, a lot of clear plastic tape, and again, a note on it that said, deliver this to the pastor. And that's when the pastor you know, thought to himself, this, this is a bomb, this, this, this is a bomb. And so he quickly did what I guess any pastor would do. He got a church member to take it outside. <laughs> that's, 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 that's a true story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he got a church member, you know. Uh, I wouldn't get a church member at all. I would get Warren. You know. <laughs> Warren, I need you to take this outside for me. Um, no, it's not a joke, you all. They, somebody took it outside, and then uh, the custodian called 911, um, Emmanuel has a preschool, and so the building is filled with children, and so they evacuated the building, all the children outside, all of the staff. Everybody left, and they waited outside. The fire department got there real quickly, and then the police, and then the bomb squad. The police bomb squad came. They were talking about the best way to handle this safely. They, they were about to explode it outside, and then they thought instead, let's just try to take it apart. Let's try to open it and just open it and, and without detonating it. So that was the plan. Uh, so they opened it. Uh, it was not a bomb, y'all. It wasn't a bomb. Guess what it was? Uh, y'all are thinking, peeps, because <laughs> we didn't know candy thing. No. Um, that case, uh, that little white box was, was stacked with silver bars, well, like silver, solid silver. And with it, this uh, little clutch of solid gold coins, and all together, the worth of that, those precious metals was over $13,000. And there was a note inside that said, Dear Pastor, please use these resources uh, toward the Easter Missions Fund. Um, it was an offering for the Missions Fund, over $13,000. And so, it, it, at first, it seemed to be something that they thought it was going to blow the whole building to smithereens, you know, and it turns out to be only an explosion of joy, you know. It was, it was just an offering. Um, when Jesus first goes into the temple this day, he, uh, it's an explosion of sorts. He explodes on the hypocrites in that place. He, he explodes on those religious leaders who think they run that place, and they do run that place. Don't be fooled. They run that place, and it runs exactly like they want it to run, and it runs to their benefit, and they are delighted, and they are in charge, and they despise the fact that Jesus has the audacity to walk in and ruin their little show. Jesus comes in. Jesus uh, drives the animals out. He turns over the tables. He turns the place upside down, and they are furious. And, and so they ask. It's the big question in John chapter 2. Who, who gave you the right 
By what authority? Who made, who died and made you God? You know? Who put you in charge? Who is it that says you can come in here and act like you own this place? Who is it that gives you the authority to walk in here and act like you're God? I mean, that's what they're asking. By what authority? We're going to have to see a sign. We need to see a miraculous sign that you have that authority. If, if you say you're sent by God to walk in here and act like you are God, then we're going to have to see some proof. Show us the sign. Now, surely by now you're not falling for that, right? They've seen enough. They've seen a lot. I mean, this is Jesus who opened the eyes of the blind, but that wasn't enough for them. Jesus who uh, healed the crippled. Jesus who healed the lepers. Jesus who called a dead man named Lazarus to walk out of his tomb. And Lazarus came out of his tomb. Jesus brought a dead man back to life before their very eyes. And now they're saying, we think we're going to have to see a sign. I'm telling you, they have seen enough. It's not that they need to see more. That's not the problem. It's not they need to see more. This is a heart problem with them. No sign is going to be enough. And so the fact that they're saying we need a sign, that don't take them seriously. They don't mean it. They've seen enough. However, Jesus does have a sign forthcoming. And he says, all right, you need a sign. Here's your sign. Destroy this temple. And I will raise it up in three days. Now they've got it. Those words, right there, those words. Destroy this temple. They got him. It, it's a, their response is a mixture of fury and delight. They are so angry, but they are also so happy because now they have him. He said something that they can use against him, and they do. Destroy this temple. They're Jews. And it's the Jewish temple. It is an architectural wonder, the temple of Herod. It is a mountain of marble covered in gold. It is magnificent. But it's the Jewish temple. And these are Jewish religious leaders. And when Jesus says, destroy this temple, y'all know, he's not talking about the temple temple. He's not talking about the building. But they don't understand that. They they misunderstand it, and they're going to use it. They're furious. They're also delighted because for them, any threat against the temple is a threat against God himself. That's blasphemy. I mean, from a perspective of Jewish law, they have him now. He's just giving them exactly the rope they need to hang him with. Destroy this temple, he says. But, But not only that, and almost even better, He said, destroy this temple. In the Roman Empire in Jesus' day, there was a law that simply said anybody who desecrates or defaces or in any way destroys any place of worship, any old pagan temple anywhere throughout the Roman Empire, it was a capital offense to destroy, to deface, to desecrate any place of worship. And so what Jesus says here is a threat against the house of worship. That's a capital offense in the Roman Empire, or so they think they have him now, you know? They've got him now. These are the words that'll get Jesus killed. In the trial of Jesus, they bring witnesses forward, and what do the witnesses say? They heard him say he was gonna destroy the temple. Now, that's not what he said. That's not what he said. What did he say? Did he say, I'm gonna destroy, I'm gonna bring this place down? Is that what he said? No. What did he say? You destroy this temple, I will raise it up. That's what he said. But they used his words against him. Witnesses come forward and say, he said he was going to destroy the temple. I mean, it's exhibit A in his court case. And this indeed becomes the words that get him killed. Destroy this temple. He's not talking about the temple, temple, y'all. He's talking about something smaller but also greater. He's talking about himself. He's talking about about his body. Destroy this temple. I will raise it up in three days. Part of me is just like, Jesus, if you want to communicate, then communicate. Say it clearly because they're going to misunderstand that. Everybody misunderstands that. He's standing in the temple and he says, destroy this temple. And everybody, everybody's dumb. 
If you say this temple and you're standing in a temple, they assume he means this temple. I mean, everybody misses it. It goes right over their heads. Even the disciples, even the disciples don't get it. I know you and I are thinking if we'd have been there, we'd have thought, oh, he's talking about Easter. But no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't have understood it either. And, and, and part of me is like, Jesus, say it clearly. But at the same time, how do you say it clearly? How do you prepare people to believe what's impossible to believe? How do you prepare people to accept what is absolutely unfathomable? That he's gonna die and come back from the dead. That does not happen. Everybody knows that dead people stay dead. Destroy this temple, Jesus says. He's talking about his body. Which means Jesus is saying something very important. Jesus is one way or the other comparing himself to the temple, but more importantly, I think Jesus is saying, I, I am the temple. Destroy this temple. He's talking about himself. He is the temple. Now, what does that mean to call him the temple? If you think of a temple as a place where people meet God, then Jesus is literally saying, if you want to meet God, then you come to me. To meet me, to see me is to see the Father. If you want to know God, you need to know me. I am the temple. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says. It's me. You got to come through me. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. That's what Jesus says. If you want to know God, you've got to know Jesus. If you want to draw near to God, you have to draw near to Jesus. If you want to love God, you have to love Jesus. This is what he's saying. And understand that the Jews don't necessarily get the depth of what he's saying, but if they did, it would, it, would, it would not help him in their eyes because either Jesus is telling the truth or, or he's not. But either way, this can't not be a big deal. It, it can't not be a big deal. If Jesus is saying this and it's not true, he's still a blasphemer. He's still saying something that, that, that would bring his death by Jewish law. But if it is the truth, if nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus, if the only way to meet with God is to come to Jesus, if the only way to know God, to draw near to God, to love God, is to draw near to Jesus and understand this is maybe true, it may be false, but it can't not be a big deal. What does he mean? To say I'm the temple. At one point, Jesus says something greater than the temple is here. He's talking about himself. How is he greater than the temple? How is Jesus the place where people can meet God? Y'all remember, it's, it's actually a couple of chapters in the Gospel of John, uh, John chapter 4, where Jesus meets the woman. We call her the woman at the well. Why do we call her that? Because he met her at the well. <laughs> yeah, it's not hard. Uh, Jesus meets the woman at the well because that's where he meets her. And uh, they have this conversation where Jesus just, oh man, he just keeps going straight to her, straight to her heart. And this poor woman has lived such a difficult life. She has so many broken relationships. She can't marry and stay married. She cannot in any way find a good man and keep a good man. And that is just a symptom of a, of a, of a deeper sickness in her soul. And Jesus keeps trying to go to that so that he can set her free from all of that. But she doesn't want to go there. And so if you notice the conversation, she keeps changing the subject. And, and if you've ever had a conversation with somebody, um, they'll often, if, if they don't want to really talk about truth, they may often change the subject to just religion in general. And that's what she does. She'll change the subject with Jesus to just religion in general as a way of distracting or, or you know, pivoting the conversation. Get the heat off of herself. So in this conversation, she brings to Jesus what would have been in her day the biggest religious controversy. The question, everybody's arguing, you know. So when Jesus starts pointing out like her life and, and her problems, she says, well I, well, I can see you're some kind of preacher. So let me ask you, you know, let me ask you. The, the Jews say that the only place to meet God is in their temple on Mount Zion. But the Samaritans, you understand, Samaritans can't go in the temple, uh, in the Jewish temple in Mount Zion. So the Samaritans, they have their own mountain, Mount Gerizim, and, and they have their temple there. So which temple's right? Now, in Jesus' day, man, Samaritans and Jews, they, they fight over that question. 
And she thinks, now I'm going to bring up this question. It's like rolling a stink bomb into the whole conversation. And Jesus isn't going to want to talk about her anymore. But what happens is Jesus says the most amazing thing here. She's like, which temple is it? Which mountain is it? And Jesus just says, girl, worship isn't about which temple you're in. It's not about temples. It's about truth. If you really want to worship God, you got to worship God in spirit and in truth. It's not about what temple. It's not about which mountain. And for that matter, it's not about whose church or what day of the week it is. It's not about any of those things. It's about Jesus. It's always about Jesus. I mean, I know we're in church, and y'all have to understand, I love church. I don't think anybody's going to question that. I love church. I just do. I've been here all day, and I'm really sorry that it's about over. I could do this forever. I love it. I love it. I love the singing. I love the praying. I love seeing you get out of your cars and walk across the courtyard. I love every bit of it. I can't wait till Wednesday night. I can't wait till next Sunday. I just love this, y'all. I'm, I'm going to go home and eat lunch. I'm going to come back this afternoon just because I love it here. I am coming back this afternoon. I've worked, but uh, I work here. I, I love it here. I, I, I love all of this, so don't get me wrong, but it's not about church, you all. I know I said that at Easter we often go to church, and I'm so glad that you're here, but understand, it's not about church. At the end of the conversation with the woman at the well, the amazing thing is the woman goes running off to the town. She was running off to all these people, and he said, I mean, she comes up to the people and she says, y'all gotta come, y'all gotta come to my church. Is that what she says? I want y'all to come to my or come to my temple and my mountain. I finally figured out which mountain, which temple. No, what does she say? Come see a man. She brings him to Jesus. You understand? It's not about the mountain. It's not about the temple. It's not about church. It's about Jesus. Amen. She brings the people to Jesus. It's always about Jesus. I love Woodburn Baptist Church, but let me tell you, Woodburn Baptist Church is not here to get this building full of people. Woodburn Baptist Church is here to get people full of Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's always about Jesus. People say, you know, you must be some kind of pastor. Let me ask you, does a person have to go to church to go to heaven? And of course the answer is no. You don't go to church to go to heaven because I know people who go to church every single Sunday and they're not going to see heaven. Because it's not about coming to church. You can come to church Easter after Easter, Sunday after Sunday, your whole life, and you never know Jesus. You have to meet Jesus. He has to be real and alive in your life. It can't just be a story that your grandma told you. It can't just be something that you do occasionally on the weekends. This has to be real for you. You have to know Jesus. You have to meet Jesus. You have to have a personal encounter with the living Christ. It's not about church. You don't go to church to go to heaven. You have to know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, you are going to hell. Do you understand that truth? If you don't know Jesus, you're going to split hell wide open. And no matter how many times you went to church, it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. So Jesus says, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. Nobody knew what he was talking. I mean, those words got him killed. They didn't understand what he meant. He wasn't talking about the temple. Temple. He was talking about his body. And even the disciples, it, it says, they realized this. When Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this. And, and then they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. But it was later, you all. In the moment, they, they, they didn't get it either. They didn't know what Jesus was talking about. How, 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 do you possibly, how do you possibly prepare yourself for resurrection? It was later. After they saw the empty tomb, no. After they saw Jesus alive. Jesus appeared to them. He would walk into the room where they were. They'd be in the middle of a meal. The room would, would be closed. The doors locked, and he would just appear like he could pass through walls. I mean, it was amazing. He's not a ghost. 
We're not talking about coming back as a ghost. We're not talking about coming back as, a, as you know, living in everybody's hearts. We're not talking about that. He came back in the flesh. He came back. It was a physical resurrection. His body was not in the tomb. Do you understand? It's not a ghost. He came back. I know dead things usually stay dead. But, but Jesus is the only one. He has come back to life. The only way you could believe that is to meet him for yourself. And that's what happened to the disciples. They see him. They eat with him. They touch him. And when they see him alive, then they believe. So do you believe? Um. I mean, this is the Easter message. I'm almost done with it. Um, do you believe it? That Jesus died and rose again. Do you believe? He said he would, and he did what he said he would do. It's an amazing thing. He said, you destroy this temple, I will raise it up in three days. He did exactly what he said he would do. Do you, do you believe that? Because here's the thing, um, you must believe that. It's the most important question I could possibly ask you, and your response is the most important words you'll ever, ever say. Do you believe the Easter message? you believe that Jesus died and rose again? I don't think Easter's going to mean anything to any of you until you know Jesus for yourself until he is real and alive, not for other people, but for you. I understand why a lot of people don't, under, they don't like church, they don't, go to, they don't really understand church. I, I get that, because if you don't know Jesus, church has got to be a waste of time. Man, man, in this house, we're worshiping him because he's alive and real to us, and it's not singing to each other, praying to each other. Man, man we got a living Christ that we worship. It changes everything. Do, do, do you believe? I'm not asking you to feel anything. I think that's the trap that many people fall into. They think that a decision to follow Christ must be accompanied with this great feeling. I mean, you, you come to church like today, a man choir was awesome, and I was going, I mean, I was jumping like a frog down here. I was so excited and, and singing my guts out and my hands are up, and th that's really who I am. That, that's just very much, I, I would be doing that if y'all weren't in the room. That's just who I am. And you may see that kind of display. You may see other people that really get happy and all of that, and you just don't feel that, and maybe you're waiting for that. Like, you want to feel something. You want to feel what other people seem to feel. You want to be stirred and moved. And um, I'm just telling you that you're not being asked to feel anything. I don't know that you ever will, and that's not even the point. A, a relationship with Jesus, an encounter with the living Jesus, it doesn't require that you feel something. It just requires that you believe something. Whosoever believes is what the scripture says. And what you're being asked to believe is actually quite simple. I mean, I know it's a thick Bible. There's a whole lot of stuff in here. And if we started going through it, we'd probably disagree on some things. And that's okay. We can disagree on a lot of things. Nobody's asking you to make a decision about creation or evolution. You don't have to make a decision about that. Nobody's asking you to make a decision about transgenderism. Or a decision about homosexuality or whether you should go to your niece's gay wedding or whether or not Christians should play the lottery. We're not asking you to make a decision about any of those things. It comes down to one thing and it's this thing. I mean, the scripture says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It comes down to that. You got to believe in your heart. No. I don't, I don't know exactly what that means, to be honest. I mean, because, I mean, we know about open heart surgery. We know your heart's a, a muscular organ. It just beats and pumps your blood. I mean, I don't know what it means to have that belief in my heart. I just know that that belief has to go somewhere besides just in your head. Because probably everybody in this house would say they believe in the resurrection. You came to church on Easter. You bought a dress. You baked a ham. You've been eating peeps all week, you know? 
it's Easter. You believe in Easter, but, but it's up here. It's just belief in the sense you're saying, yeah, that's probably true. But one way or another, we've got to get that, that belief from just in your head to your heart where it really begins to change things for you. Like I say, it's true. If it's not true, it's false. But the one thing it can't be is no big deal. If Jesus is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do, then do you understand? He wants to do that for you. In you. It's not even complicated. It's the simplest thing in the world. Paul says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It is not any more complicated than that. All you have to do is believe and receive it. Just ask, you just gotta want it. You just gotta want Jesus. It's simple. But to say it's simple is not to say it's easy. Some of you know how hard it is because you've been saying no to this message your whole life. You've been saying no to Jesus your whole life. So to say that it's simple doesn't make it easy because deep down you know that to surrender to him means he's going to change everything. I mean, we said he likes to make dead things come to life and old things new. And there's a lot of things dead in you he's going to bring back to life. And there are some things in you that probably need to be put to death and he's going to put those to death. I mean, he's going to come into your life and he's going to change some things. All of a sudden, you got to recognize he has the authority to command your life. And you know that, and that's probably why you continue to hang back. You just won't quite submit because you know if he comes in, he's going to want to take over, and he does. But oh my goodness, don't you understand what he wants to do for you? Aren't you tired? Aren't you just tired of having to live a life where you have to keep so many secrets? Just ever get tired of, of watching other people who live full lives with purpose and your life seems so aimless? You ever just tired of living this entire life of nothing special? You ever just tired of always wanting to be a better mom, but then all of a sudden, man, you were yelling and cussing just like last week, and no matter how hard you try, you can't change Man, I mean, the addictions, the, the, the hang-ups, the problems, we, we say we're going to change ourselves, but we can't change ourselves. We, we try to forgive ourselves, but we can't even forgive ourselves. You understand, this is why you need a Savior. Man. You can't do what Jesus says he'll do for you. You can't. And the only way you'll know peace, the only way you'll know salvation, the only way you'll ever see heaven, the only way you'll know salvation is through Jesus. Amen. Jesus said, destroy this temple I will raise it again in three days. He did what he said he would do. Did you believe that? If you believe that, will you let that knowledge move deeper from just your head so that it's not just an Easter thing, so that it becomes an everyday thing, this truth, that, that Jesus lives, that he's real, and that he wants to live and be real in your life. Will you allow him to come into your life and command your life in this way? I, I, I don't know how you could possibly say no. Why would you not want him? It's probably the words that got him killed. <laughs> he just said, destroy this temple. And he wasn't talking about the temple temple. He's talking about his, his own body. You destroy this temple, Jesus said, and I will raise it up in three days. And he did exactly what he said he would do. I just want you to know that Jesus always does what he says he will do. And if you will allow him, he will do all these things that he says he can do. He will do them for you. You've seen him do things in the lives of other people. He will do the same for you. If you will only believe. Pray with me. It is a gorgeous spring day, Lord Jesus, and you have brought back summer from winter. You have brought back life from death. So many brown things are turning green again, and it is glorious in our sight. We love it. But Lord, the question becomes, can you do that same sort of transformation 
in a person like me? Can you take my dead heart, make it live again? Can you take my cold heart, make it love again? Can you take all the things I have done in my whole life that I can never forget, Lord, can you possibly forgive those things and set me free? from my past. Lord, can you do these things? You have said that you can do these things and others say that you have done these things for them. Lord, what you have done for others, will you do that for me? Will you do that for us? Lord, I pray and what remains of this Easter service that the people in this room and the people in the sound of my voice will not be satisfied with a trip to church on Easter. Lord Jesus, I pray that before this moment passes, we will all have our personal encounter with you, O oh Jesus, alive and real in our lives. Let us, Lord, be settled with nothing less than a personal encounter with you. And may that encounter change our lives now and in the life to come. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.